Welcome back, everyone. So uh, we are now back to our uh, another segment. So we have been uh, discussing uh, a lot of um, a, talking about the financial services and API use cases, and then we have uh, he heard a lot of um, the the voice from the bank side, from the technology side, on the open banking perspective. So in this section, uh, we are talking more about from the enterprise perspective. So uh, we are really excited uh, to invite uh, Adidas. Uh, so uh, Jet Jesus, uh, who is the API evangelist at Adidas, will be sharing about how they are doing their API platform and. He will share a topic talk about multi protocol API at scale in Adidas. So, uh, Jesus, nice to meet you. So, how are you? Nice to meet you, Patrick. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm delighted yeah. to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, uh, I can already see your screen uh, on, on, uh, on, on slide on screen. So, it should be all good. So, I will pass the time to you. So, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, hello everyone, and happy to be here, as I said. And uh, the topic for for this speech is about multi protocol APIs at scale in Adidas, as you can see, right? So basically, um, just as a first introduction to to myself, uh, I'm basically uh, my background is basically a, as a software engineer and architect, and I work with APIs for a long time, and I right now working for the Adidas API platform. And okay, regarding this track and and this specific uh, section uh, is about uh, API governance and um, and a APIs and enterprise context, right? But it's also about architecture and exploitation. And I think that we think in the API platform in Adidas that uh, these three main areas are related to many technical and not technical topics, right? Technical depth, redundancies, optimization of resources and implementation of enterprise API features, right? But basically means that we are going, uh, our time to market is uh, meaningfully uh, reduced and we are lowering the, the cost of integration as well in, in, our, in our partners, with our partners and with uh, internal systems. So basically our agenda, uh, and we'll, be, we'll go fast <laughs> through this, uh, is about the Adidas API, API landscape, yes. Very briefly, and I like to 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 go through the what we understand about multi-protocol and multi-style API that is really different, and the, there is a very interesting discussion about this. Uh, we'll talk also briefly about the API gateways and the issues that we found in the last uh, in the last years uh, with this approach, and uh, what is a possibly one mitigation and one new thing to apply governance to uh, APIs in the in, in big enterprises. So, okay, we'll go very quickly through the Adidas API landscape. So basically, as you can imagine, you can find hundreds of APIs and, that are connecting systems each other in, in such a big corporation like Adidas. So we have um, many, about around 400 uh, base APIs. Most of most of, real, most of them uh, based on uh, um, um, RPC and REST uh, APIs. Many consumers and millions and millions of requests at the interaction. Right. Um, this is a complex landscape. And uh, the full picture of the Adidas APA um, ecosystem is, is complex. So basically we have, we are including API gateway in, in Kubernetes clusters and we apply an operational model based on continuous delivery pipelines. And we keep manifest files for the API gateway configuration in Git and in Bitbucket. And we also use um, in a very intensive way an API registry. And we of course apply all the preservability measures that you can you can imagine that is usually applied to these uh, uh, enterprise APIs. And one of the most interesting things in the, API, in the Adidas API lifecycle is the uh, is that uh, we have included as usual phases uh, like discovery, use, analyze, and update to uh, to ensure that the evolution of APIs is uh, is part of the of the life cycle itself. And we can you can see guys um, in the Adidas API guidelines in GitHub everything 
guardian the um, the main guidelines to to build maintain and evolve uh, apis in adidas they are really quite compelling and you can find out of uh, uh, a lot of advice here for for your apis if you want so I like to go through the concept of multi-style or multi-protocol APIs. They are not the same thing, but it's just to be on the same page and we can be sure that we are talking about the same things. And this is the, the multiplicity of um, uh, styles and protocols in, in APIs uh, rose from the, the beginning of the microservice architecture, right? So basically when we decompose large monoliths uh, into smaller uh, microservices responsible to do something specific, we found the, uh, the need to communicate these microservices. Uh, um, and this kind of internal and external communication one w w was one of the main challenges here. And it depends on what is the, the architecture. It can be reactive or can be based on request response on HTTP. Um, the communication uh, is, is different. So basically the the we have more and more um uh, api styles and protocols because we have basically more options because microservices and the first style is rpc and you know the very well this kind of of api where you can see the command it's basically the invocation of a specific command uh, in the api using http very easy. So, the most I think that the most frequently found uh, API style is based on HTTP 1.1 and it's REST. It's about resources and is basically following the the language in in the browser uh, to provide resources to you. Right? It's about the product. It's about the client. It's about the order, and so on. Uh, it's as I said, it's the most commonly found uh, type of uh, API right now. And by the way, of course, uh, we found problems in RPC and REST APIs. That means that uh, <clears throat> there are some specific cases, more and more frequently found cases, where we can uh, see that REST RPC is not enough. And it's about long running tasks when we are blocking connections. And it's about we, we, you don't have any streaming or server push mechanisms and you don't have any broadcasting way and so on. So basically it's about the waste of resources and um, basically uh, and probably these REST APIs are not enough for every, all the use cases. And that's why WebSockets came up um, as a way to a new protocol to, uh, to provide directional and multiplex communication with the client. And I like to talk also about the RPC and, proto and proto protocol buffers, right? As a way to be more efficient and um, and provide unit and bidirectional streaming, right? Um, the thing is that uh, is taking advantage of the HTTP2 protocol to uh, implement this pro uh, proto protocol buffer to and uh, but in the end the rpc is about the invocation of services and functions right so basically it's rpc but more efficient and as i said you can use the rpc to request response web services unidirectional streams or bidirectional streams pros and cons right the rpc is not very used but it's very efficient basically uh, it's in my experience is highly recommended but uh, you can find a lack of skills in technical tips. I recommend you guys some some fast readings about the RPC. If you don't know the the protocol, and uh, I wrote this uh, definition of the API contact that you know in Adidas the API first approach is is key, and the definition of the API contact is one of the main steps. So you can find this uh, article in, in Medium, and I recorded this session of a ERPC, client microservice, communicating with Kafka, and providing a stream, bidirectional streaming to, uh, to a ERPC client. So just, uh, you can use the link in the slide. 
Okay, GraphQL um, was invented by Facebook um, as, an, uh, as a way to send queries to a large data structure, right? So, um, because uh, you need just a small subset of data from a large data set, um, what you need to do is to send the query, right? And then um, GraphQL is, a, is about this, it's about, it's about uh, getting subsets of data, of the, of the data model um, uh, to a specific uh, a specific API endpoint. Okay, um, there are some key features as, uh, here, and but I'd like to talk about the different uh, patterns, right? So basically, here uh, GraphQL Server can be a REST wrapper. So um, this, you are applying a new layer in your architecture, and this orchestrating uh, the resources in in the REST uh, endpoints, and you are sending the queries to the to the GraphQL layer. It's possible that the GraphQL server is getting data from data sources and performing exactly the same role and so on. So basically the idea of the GraphQL is permission us is to um, avoid the REST waterfall. It's about, okay, I'm getting resources and then I have to uh, get more and more resources in a sequence of um in a sequence of a specific requests to get so to get a specific data set i need to send you to the api uh, many requests so the idea here is okay i can compose my query and get exactly what i want and um yeah and if there are incremental changes in the data model uh, these changes are not breaking uh, the contact uh, as a client and then uh, as an api consumer my contact is now broken and I can keep on working with no interruption. So yeah, it's about, um, the idea here is to, to avoid the overfetching or underfetching uh, patterns in that it are usually found in, in, in REST APIs sometimes, but there's a limited amount of tooling. So there's some pros and cons, right? Um, um, it, it's also needed to, to have a, a good catch implementation. So um, and sometimes it's not supported by some API gateways, for instance. And there's some um, you can find in the slide some specific uh, links to for fast readings about GraphQL. Right. So and then the last one is about async async API. Async API is about the description of an uh, event driven architecture. Right. Um, it's not specifically about streaming, but um, because it, Many times uh, uh, we are describing uh, APIs based on Kafka, uh, that is a stream engine. Um, you can think that the uh, async API has been thought for events, but has been thought also for streaming. That is, is quite compelling. Async API is mainly based on open API specification that is uh, I think that you can find a lot of uh, similarities with the uh, open API and therefore uh, it's not difficult to understand. And it supports many protocols related to events management and it includes also um, um, many references to the security and, and the way the server defined the, the, the resource for the stream server. Okay, so again, some first readings about Async API that is a very active community and, and is growing rapidly. Okay, the main takeaways about this multiple, multiple styles and protocols in APIs is about that uh, there are options. I, I think that uh, it's a common opinion to, to say that, okay, we don't have an, uh, uh, the best uh, API as possible. Uh, API style protocol is about use cases, is about API producer and consumers, is about your needs and requirements, right? And what is uh, the architecture you are integrating your API? Okay, and, and probably we can set up some boundaries at clear principles, and we have to consider new version of HTTP, and uh, as I said, the type of architecture and um, oriented to events or not, uh, and so on. And uh, probably we can find some specific boundaries uh, regarding the, what 
specific uh, API style is good for, right? For synchronous request response, not blocking, streaming, event driven architectures, or the management of big data sets. And I think that probably uh, we have different uh, um, different API styles for each specific case. Okay, regarding multi protocol integration, is about um, Eventually, the idea is that you are providing the capacity to to the API producers to um, to produce the API they need because they don't want to work with resources. They want to be they have to be more efficient in the consumption of cloud resources, and they have to provide the right fit to business and uh, and the systems they are integrating to. Right. So this is about variety, and we cannot uh, put, uh, build walls to the sea. And it's clear that uh, there are multiple options to the construction of APIs. One of the main problems you find is about the API registry, and uh, the idea of having an API registry is to store the description of your APIs with a standard specification, right? And they have to be available. Yeah, an API to integrate your uh, the description of your APIs with other systems. But the reality is that uh, um, commercial products are not supporting yet uh, multiple uh, API styles and protocols, right? Um, all that our wish is to have an API registry, registry that supports open API and um, asynchronous API, gRPC, and RESTQL, right? Our uh, although our primary target is the support to extend the support to async API first. Okay, I'd like to talk briefly, very briefly about the API gateway. Why to use an API gateway is because it's an architectural pattern that is isolating our APIs from the consumption and uh, from API consumers, right? And um, it's a very good architectural pattern to apply enterprise API features like catch, like uh, request information, like security, uh, authentication and, and authorization, and so on. has many advantages, and you can find uh, very good products in the market. Uh, we are talking about Kong, uh, API Manager in, in Azure, APG, API Gateway in AWS, and so on. So the big gateway is a central piece in the, in the Adidas API ecosystem. And there are some key features. I'm going to go faster <laughs> now, sorry. Um, it's about authentication and authorization. And our model is based on APG and the full integration of OpenID Connect with uh, our, our identity providers. It's about security rules, and we are following strictly following the OWASP API Security Top 10 because it's basically the, the, they are the basic uh, topic for for um, web application firewall rules. So they are a uh, very brief list of uh, security measures that we that they are the minimum to apply to an API uh, gateway security. And of course, we have to to keep this always in mind because we don't want to uh, uh, to delegate this uh, specific um, security features yeah, to the microservices. We want to apply this to the big gateway when where they can be controlled and and we can apply the governance rules. Right. We are talking about rate limiting. We are talking about performance and catch. We are showing here uh, the manifest files for Kong on Kubernetes, right? And some key parameters. We are talking about API transformation. And we are talking about, uh, yeah, manifest files, you know, a schema validation. So basically, your, the, the, the body in your request can be validated against our data model definition, request size. And in the end, the idea here is to, uh, to gather everything, all the enterprise API features to be applied up as modules or plugins to the API gateway where we can have full visibility and full control of, of them. And the advantages of having a gateway is that you can integrate uh, heterogeneous systems uh, in the same API. And even you can gather uh, external APIs and based on monoliths, based on microservices, whatever. It doesn't matter what is there on premises or in cloud, but the API gateway is key to federate uh, resources in the same API. And 
you can uh, apply all the governance rules you need. It is important to have always to be aware always about functional and non-functional requirements. And of course, uh, you have to apply an operational model. And API gateway operations are key for this, right? Because um, you can um, have a, the source, your configuration in the API gateway a source code. Maybe here is that uh, um, you can track all changes and you can uh, apply the, uh, the automation. Okay, go faster in this in this way. So basically, as I said, is is everything the configuration of the API gateway is based on source code and manifest files. Okay, this is fine, but we want something else, and we found issues, right? So the main issues were about uh, we can't um, um, we can federate the the APIs. We can we can group the APIs in bigger entities, right? Is um, we can apply relationships with APIs. That, I think that is the main issue here. And um, besides, the, they are not correlated to the specific data domains. And of course, uh, regarding the API gateway operations. Um, all these enterprise API features are not, are not included in a standard uh, ten, uh, specification. So, because uh, we think that uh, Open API, Async API, and so on, that they are basically technical specifications, but they are not gathering the enterprise API features that we need to gather to build the, uh, the unique source of tools uh, that we need to start with the automation. Okay. And in business, of course, uh, we need um, to get. Uh, we need to apply all the KPIs, uh, the parameters to meet all the KPIs that are needed to, to, to meet. Okay. So basically, the idea here is that uh, uh, to have only one specification, right, to rule all of them. So basically, uh, to have a metadata specification that is gathering all these enterprise API features. And sorry, uh, my apologies, but I will go faster through the slides right now okay oh, sorry okay just a brief introduction to metadata and uh, to have a unique because we want to have a unique source of tools and we want to guarantee the uh, the access to data products and we have to um and we have to uh, allow the access to data products of course and i this is more or less the structure of the integration specification with different sections. It's about business semantics, it's about the inventory of applications and the relationship to technical specifications and related resources. It's about the list of the consumers, scope, procedures, and the technical contact, right? Regarding that, it's about non functional requirements, feasibility, availability, quota everything that we have talked about before regarding the configuration of the API gateway. So the, these are the main features for the integration specification, and we want to uh, include all the, all the um, settings about operations and, and uh, relationships of the API with .NET domains and other APIs to compose bigger entities, as I said. And this, more, this is basically, uh, 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 well, just a little bit, a little bit <laughs> a small picture about the integration specification as a prototype. Okay, so if we want to put everything together, is this is more or less the la the, the the landscape, and we have an integration hub that is a, basically an application that is in really is using this integration specification to put everything together regarding the inventory of applications, enterprise data catalog, the API registry, and entity provider, and putting everything in relation with the API Gateway and Kafka APIs. Even with this, more or less, is the, um, uh, the translation to, to the technical landscape uh, and the tooling of the schema, right? Um, you can see here how can we put in relationship uh, the operational model in the continuous uh, delivery pipelines with the rest of systems. An integration hub application that is basically uh, using the integration specification to offer to the API consumer all the information he needs. 
Okay, so we have different models and different use cases to you, to apply the automation pipeline uh, according to this integration specification, and then provide full uh, on a fully automated pipeline that is translating to production to, in uh, all the configuration settings that are recorded in the integration specification. So the API producer can change a parameter, I don't know, for instance, in the API consumer quota, and then the continuous delivery pipeline is triggered and we are applying this specific um, uh, change to the to the API gateway but it's also um, regarding how you show the information about the APIs not only as an isolated API in the API registry you are showing uh, a bunch of APIs that are related to a specific data domain and a data product it's very interesting uh, interesting feature that you can use to uh, put the uh, relationship between your different uh, resources in the company. And I think that uh, because you are integrating also business and user semantics in the descriptions, the API discoverability increases a lot. Okay, I don't want, I, I think that we are running out of time. So I go faster and um, probably we can see that uh, uh, our next step is about the agenda with integration specification that you can read here. And um, it's expected that in the next year, leaders will go further with this integration specification and will get the, <laughs> all the benefits from, from this approach in the governance of our APIs. So, yeah, please, uh, this is my address. If you want to know more, please. Uh, Please uh, send me an email and uh, I'll be delighted to send you more, to be in touch with, to to share uh, any any information about any topic related to this, to this yeah. presentation. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Jesus, for your sharing. I, I think there's a, quite a lot of content and then a lot of them is quite very interesting. I was also thinking to ask some questions, but we are uh, running out of time. So maybe uh, we will share to you and then I will also suggest the audience to, um, to reach you out. For some of the topics, especially myself, uh, although may not have enough time, I am quite curious how uh, editors to manage three hundred um, uh, API owners. <laughs> this is quite quite <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah. But I think we don't have enough time here. So Jesus, we will have some chat offline, and then I I think there may be some audience although uh, interest to know more from you. So uh, thanks a lot for your support. So um, Jesus, so uh, uh, see you soon and see you later. Okay, thanks for your support. Th thank you, buddy. Okay. Thank you all. Bye bye.